Evidently, I have arrived. I heard this was one of the greatest churches in America right here. Amen. Before you sit down, I know you've been very active. I know you've been very involved in the praise and worship, and I'm so grateful for that. And I'm going to try to use my time wisely tonight. You didn't come to impress me, but I'm so impressed with you. Um, I'm fortunate enough. I think you call it fortunate. I do a lot of traveling. I do a lot of speaking. I just don't see atmospheres like this anymore. And I'm so hungry for it. This is, this is the kind of group I need to be in the middle in. Because I'm crazy. I am not a normal Christian. I am an extreme Christian. And I just, uh, man, I'm so grateful to be here for the invitation. And I'd like to do something. Um, I have a, a guy who mentored me in ministry, Dr. Miles Monroe. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. But he was my mentor. And he, he changed my whole world. He changed everything that I knew about church, about God, about ministry, about everything. And um, you don't know what it feels like to come into a place that has, you've never been and just be honored. That, that feels amazing to come up here and, and you stood and you clapped. That honor, honor feels great. Honor feels great. But I've never understood something. I've been doing conferences for almost 30 years and... I've seen congregations go crazy for the guy that's going to come and leave. But they never clap for the people who came to stay. You have two of the greatest pastors in America. I need you to thank them. Uh, we're getting ready to sit down. Turn around before you do and tell three people, hug them and say, Jesus is why I'm so pretty. Come on, three people, Jesus is why I'm so pretty. I don't really know how to act. I'm not, I'm not up here trying to bust on other churches, but I go to so many churches, it's just, I have to get something started. And I came in here and I walked in the door and I was like, whoa, whoa. I said, I done found my people. Hallelujah. And um, you guys, I usually preach on the floor. So y'all got my spot. You gonna make me stay on the stage. I haven't preached on the stage in 10 years. I always read my scripture, then I come down there, but you're, I need to warn y'all, I spit bad. I've been known to hit about seven rows back sometime when I really get anointed. And uh, I've been in California five years now, and I pastor in, in the Bay Area, the Silicon Valley, and uh, we've been there five years. We took over an existing church that in the 90s was a very, very large church. And uh, the gentleman was 73, and we put together a succession plan. I had been in the South my whole life. Uh, I'm 50 years into this Southern accent. It's not going anywhere. I'm sorry if it gets on your nerves. But it gets me a lot of conversations in California, I can tell you that. And um, we love California. And God has given me a love for the place and for the people. And uh, the other 49 states think we're all nuts. I don't know if y'all know that. But um, I came here because I believe the next great move in this nation is going to come out of this state. I moved my family 2,492 miles across the nation because I believe with all my heart God is going to turn all the eyes to the west. And the next great thing ain't going to come out of the Bible Belt. The next great thing is going to come out of this state, and you're a part of that. If you believe it with me, say amen. I won't take a long time. Like I said, I want to use my time wisely. I don't take a long time telling you who I am and, 
and all about me. I, uh, and if you see my, my lip drooping a little bit on the left side, y'all don't know this, I just had surgery. And uh, the doctor did not want me to take this appointment. And I told him, I said, we've been trying for two years to get here. And I said, there's no way I'm going to counsel. I had to have a place taken off my face two weeks ago. And when they, get in, when they got in, it was so bad, they had to do major reconstruction surgery. So you know what happened before I came? My wife put makeup on me. I hate makeup. I hate that cake face feeling. I hate it. That's why I shine on all my videos. I just got the glory all over me. I'm just shining. My wife said, come here, and she started covering up everything. So I really did. I wanted to be with you. I, I, I called and checked up on you. I don't know if you know Jonathan Trailer. I, uh, uh, he, he, he helps us out a lot. I saw on Instagram that he was here. I said, I said, I'm going to this church tonight. I see you've been there. I said, tell me something about him. He said, oh, my goodness. He said, they love praise, they love worship, they love word, they love ministry, they love altar calls. I said, you've said enough, I'm sold. <laughs> Do they have any holiness churches on the West Coast? Does any church, ain't really none like, have y'all ever heard of holiness churches? I was raised in, the, I got somebody back here knows about them. Yeah. I was raised in the holiness church. You know what the holiness church is? If it's fun, it's wrong. Okay. Real strict. Most people out here in the West have never even heard of them. I mean strict, strict. The la and all the rules were toward the ladies. The dress had to be a certain length. Come on, they couldn't wear makeup. Jesus. Couldn't wear a bunch of jewelry. I've seen women that got up on the stage in the church I was raised in. They had to take off their wedding band before they get on stage and sing. Wouldn't, wouldn't let them wear just so legalistic. So religious. That's what I was raised in. My mom would come up. I mean, and, and, all, and all the girls could never cut their hair. They pulled it on top of their head. And they wore them dresses. They didn't have makeup. Didn't have on jewelry. My mom would say, son, you're going to marry one of these good little girls in this church. And I'd say, mama. And I went out and found me the woman with the biggest face of makeup I could find. She had mascara and eyeshadow out to her ears when I met her. Went to college on an athletic scholarship, got really saved, turned around by a bunch of people that saw God in a whole different way. I had a lot of problems. I had a lot of addictions, a lot of issues, and they didn't judge me, and they watched God change me. I gave in that scholarship, went and entered the pastoral curriculum at this particular institution, and three years, 36 months later, I graduated with a Bible degree. Seven days later, I married my wife, and seven days later, I started a church at age 21. So I'm not that old, but I've been pastoring 33 years and, and been doing this. And I know after 30-something years when I'm, to, when I'm at a place where God is and where he's not. And God is in this place. And that's precious. And don't ever lose that. Don't ever lose that. I want you to open your Bible, your phone, your Bible app, however you get there, to Psalm chapter 8. I'm a discipler. Uh, your pastor called me a preacher, but I'm kind of a teacher. And then when I get happy about what I'm teaching, I start preaching. Um, I really don't ever preach on the stage. I hope I don't, you know, do a mosh pit and just dive off this thing here in a little while. Um, but I'm going to push the envelope a little bit tonight. Because I feel like I'm in one of those churches where I can. I wouldn't preach this everywhere. But I feel like y'all just as crazy as I am. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to push it a little bit. And uh, if, if you want to argue with my theology, I'll, I'll talk to you all you want to. My email is pastormarco at yahoo.com. And you talk to me. Every, everything you want to talk about, we'll talk about it. Psalm 8. I want to talk about original intent. I want to know what God originally intended. I don't know what, I don't want to know what has morphed over thousands of years. What did he originally intend? And I believe God gave a mandate in Genesis chapter one and that mandate has never changed. And I'm going to preach that tonight. And then I believe God's going to minister to us at the end. 
And God's going to do something fantastic in your life. Do you have it on the screen, if you would, guys? Psalm 8, I'm going to read the whole thing. New King James. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Look at this right here. Set your glory above the heavens, and out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Next verse, thank you. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you would visit him? Listen now. For you have made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. Listen to me now. You have given man control over what you made. Pastors all the time, well, God is in control. I've probably said that early on. People in this that's been speaking here probably said it. Let me tell you, when you hear God is in control, that is code for I have no idea how to explain that. Okay? The Bible does not say God is in control. The Bible says you are in control and God is in ownership. The fact is, if God was in control, he'd have all this fixed before breakfast. The reason it's in the mess is because God has not been in control. Give me some time. I'll wrap that up. I know that's a big one. You've made him to have dominion over the works of your hands, and you put all things under whose feet? Man's feet. All sheep, oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Can we go to Genesis 1 real quick? And that'll be the last one I'll read. I'll just read those two. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Next verse. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Lord, bless your word in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen together. All right. At my church, we talk to each other. Is that okay? So tell your neighbor on both sides, say, here we go, neighbor, here we go. Do y'all shout here? Okay. I need you to amen me every once in a while, even if you don't agree with me, just amen me. Okay. There is a difference between the earth and the world. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. But the earth is not the world. For God so loved the world, not the earth, that he gave his only begotten son. The word world in the Greek is cosmos. It actually means governing systems and patterns of systems. The Bible is very clear. I'm doing a lot of things real quick. I got about four or five hours of preaching. I'm gonna do it in about 35 minutes, okay? So I need you to listen good. So we understand that the world is the political systems, the judicial systems, the scholastic systems, the financial systems, the business systems. That is the world. And Jesus is God's answer, not to the earth. There's nothing wrong with the earth. The only thing wrong with the earth is the world. We got people meeting all over the world trying to fix the earth. <laughs> the earth in itself is pure. It's the world that is messing up the earth. The world is the systems of men. And for God so loved the world, the patterns, the governing systems, the way that the earth operates, he sent his only begotten son. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. <laughs> Not I'm the light of the earth. I'm the light of the world. I am the light to these systems that are messed up and do not know me. The Bible says that Satan is the God of this world. That the systems are being run by evil. And then we sit back and blame all these things saying God is in control. <laughs> Let me tell you something about God is in control. There'll be a hurricane that'll run through. 
<coughs> the Midwest somewhere and wipe out a whole subdivision. And every preacher in America, well, God is in control. My God does not wipe out subdivisions. Okay? That does not mean that God was in control. That's not a time where you say, God did that. And then I remember I saw the, the uh, mayor of New York City during COVID. He said, why has God done this to us? I wanted to ram my head through the TV. <laughs> God didn't do this to us. It is the God of this system, Satan, that has done this to us. And God owns the earth, but somebody else is in control of the world. I am... If God was in charge of all the hurricanes and all the floods and all the earthquakes and everything and all the tsunamis and all the every, everything that was bad and we call natural disasters, then when the storm came and the boat was sinking and Jesus went to the bow of the boat, stretched out his hand and rebuked the wind and the waves. If God would have been in control, Jesus would have been rebuking his father. And Jesus said, I and the Father are one. I don't do anything unless I see my Father do it, and I don't say anything unless I've heard my Father say it. You will never see the Father and the Son contradict one another. <laughs> and so Jesus would have never been rebuking his Father. So you got to understand, God's original intent was he never intended for earth, stay with me now, to operate apart from heaven. God's original intent is that earth was a physical expression of a spiritual heaven. God created the heavens, that's the parent realm, but it's invisible. And he created the earth, and that's what comes out of the invisible realm. For the Bible says the things that we cannot see are eternal, but the things we can see are temporary. That chair you're sitting in is going to pass away one day. But there are things going on above your head that you can't see that are eternal and they will never pass away. Invisible does not pertain to the object. It pertains to your eyes. When you say invisible, it doesn't mean it's not there. It means that your eye cannot perceive the image. So there is a whole world that is the parent world that God says is unchanging, that my eyes cannot see and perceive the images, but it's more real than the chair that's holding your weight. And God made that realm first, and out of it, he made the earth. And he himself existed, and out of himself, he made Adam. See, uh, pastor, can I go further? Am I doing all right? Whenever God wants something, he doesn't speak to what he wants. He speaks to what holds it and tells it to let it go. Go read Genesis. God didn't say, let there be fish. He said, let the waters bring forth. In other words, he said, let the water let go of what's already in it. The water already has potential for fish, so I'm commanding the water to release your potential. He didn't say let there be Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Earth and Mars. He said let the heavens bring forth because the heavens already had the potential for the stars and the moon and all of the planets. Come on, somebody. He didn't say let there be grass. He said let the earth bring forth every seed and every herb that I put in it. He spoke to the earth and the earth let it go. And then when he wanted man, he spoke to himself and said let us make man in our image and out came Adam. You didn't come from just mama. You didn't come from just daddy. You didn't just come from that family. You didn't just come from that side of town. You came out of God and God had a purpose for you before you got here and tonight we're gonna find out what that purpose is somebody shout hallelujah Yay. hallelujah hallelujah I don't get don't do that to me hallelujah don't let the skin fool you It's one of them churches you got to drink some water. Can I go deeper? <laughs> Adam was a physical expression of his God. Earth 
was a physical expression of heaven. That's why the first thing in earth was called Eden, which means paradise. Heaven also means paradise. And you got to understand that when God put Adam in the garden, he was to rule the garden, he was to rule the earth, he was to have dominion, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. That was God's original intent for mankind, not maleness, mankind. Because when God made man, he didn't make male, he made a kind. And then he took the kind and male and female, he made, oh, Jesus. I, I got so much to unpack. Can I keep going? Is that all right? Can I keep going? <clears throat> and God put Adam in the earth, and Adam is supposed to function just like his God. God does not use words to communicate. He uses words to create. And God said, and it was. And God said, and it was. And God said, now look what he did to Adam. He put Adam in the garden and he said, whatever you call it, that's what it is. You know what I think's funny? Is God didn't make Adam until last. So everything walked around five days not knowing what it was. Because Adam had to give everything its identity and God chose Adam to function just like his heavenly father. I'm really going to push the envelope. Like I said, remember the email address I gave you if you got a problem with it. I'm going to push the envelope. God didn't have one son. Go read Matthew chapter 3. God had two sons because when you trace the genealogy of Jesus, it'll go back to Adam and then it'll say, Adam, the son of God. Well, who could his father have been? So God had two sons. One was a man of the flesh, one was a man of the spirit. And tonight you're in the first one or you're in the second one. There is no option. <laughs> okay. So Adam walked around using his words to create. And everything he would speak to, he gave it its identity. He would create. God made the earth to respond, not to his hands, but to his mouth. And we'd never hear of work, sweat, or toil until after sin. And then after sin, he's got to go start working with his hands. Because the earth was never meant to respond to his hands. It was meant to respond to his words. Now... That scripture I read, Psalm chapter 8, says that God took man and crowned him <clears throat> with glory and honor. God doesn't wear clothes like we wear. God is adorned in glory and he's adorned in honor. And God made man in his image, put him in the earth and took that same glory from himself and crowned man with glory and honor. And the Old Testament glory means weight and authority. So Adam walked in the earth, this is so cool, and when he would speak, he would speak with glory. In other words, he would talk and heaven would back him up. So Adam could say it in the earth, and because he was crowned with God's weight and God's authority, God would get behind what he would say, and whatever Adam would call it, that's what it would be. I'm trying to teach you original intent. When God started everything, he intended it to operate like it is operating as I'm speaking to you now. God would speak it, and it would be, and the earth was meant to respond to words. And Adam was put here to govern the earth. Then Adam sinned. What does Romans 3.23 say? For all have sinned, and lost the glory. So Adam sins. And all of a sudden he's locked and trapped into a world that no longer responds to him. He speaks and nothing happens. Why? Because heaven is no longer backing it up. Because when Adam sinned, he declared independence from heaven. 
So earth now has declared its independence from heaven and now the floods begin to come. Now the hurricanes begin to blow. Now the earth begins to quake because the Bible says that the earth is in the pains of childbirth awaiting for the sons of God to be revealed. The earth don't know what to do. The wind don't know how hard to blow. The rain don't know when to stop. Why? Because the earth has lost its governor. Adam was put here to God. God owns it. But he put it under man's authority. How many of you have ever leased or rented anything? Okay. You don't own it. But during the terms of the lease or the rental agreement, you are in charge of the activities that take place. So this building used to be a Wells Fargo call center, I think I heard now it's a church. In other words, whoever possesses it at the time is in charge of the activities. So Adam, Adam was in charge of all the activities that went on on earth. When Adam sinned, Satan became the God of this world. Now the cosmos is messed up and the earth is in pain. Ooh, I love the Bible. See, this stuff's in the Bible. Yeah, every bit of it's in the Bible. Okay? Now, Adam ate from a tree. All right? God said, don't eat from this tree, for in the day you do, you will die. Well, when Adam ate it, he didn't fall over to die. So what happened? That word said that the trees were in the midst of the garden. And by the way, there was not one tree, there were two. The first one gets all the press, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but there's also the tree of life. The Bible says they were in the midst of the garden. I always was taught in Sunday school and coming up in church, midst meant in the center or in the middle. But I said, there's something here I'm missing. So I started studying it, and that word midst in the Hebrew means suspended. So every tree is rooted in the ground, but there are two that are hanging. But they have fruit with no root. And he takes of a tree that is suspended in the midst of the garden. See, when Adam took that fruit, he did not die physically because that was not a physically rooted tree. Jesus in Revelation 3 says, to him who overcomes, I will give of him to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That tree was rooted in the heavens. When Adam ate, he lost his connection with heaven. So he's functioning in the earth. He's got a soul and he's got a body, but he's dead spiritually. Because he ate from a tree that declared independence from his spiritual home. And now he's trapped in a world that no longer listens nor regards him. And that's in chapter 3. Chapter 4 and 5, we already got murder. That's how fast sin deteriorates. We got eating an apple in one chapter and two chapters later we got Cain murdering somebody. Sin takes it down so fast. You go from paradise to murder with one sin. Can I keep going? Some of y'all looking at me. You ever seen a deer in head like you? I'm a teacher, but I'll get happy and run around in a minute. Just give me some time. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Ooh, I feel something stirring in here. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, something's going to happen before you leave. Tell them something's going to happen before you leave. <clears throat> okay. So now, Satan is the god of this world, and we've got wars, we've got rumors of wars, we've got starvation, we've got famine, we've got death, we've got evil, we've got witchcraft, we've got carnality, we've got idols, we've got bell worship, we've got nation against nation, <clears throat> we've got natural disasters, all this stuff is going on. Why? Man has lost his dominion. Man is no longer controlling things. And so the Bible says in the fullness of time, meaning at the right time, Jesus came. 
The Bible calls Jesus the second or the last Adam. Why? Because if an Adam screws it up, it's going to take an Adam to fix it. I'm submitting to you tonight, Jesus did not come so you could, get, so you could say a prayer and get a t-shirt and then go home and try to do good things. The original intent of God was that he put man in the earth and crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet and let him be in charge of all the work of his hands. I am calling for a generation that will go back out and enter the financial system, enter the school system, enter the judicial system, enter it and understand that you are now the light of the world. You are a city set on a hill. You are a light in the darkness. You are the sun. Of the, the God, I feel something happening in this place. Somebody that's got to realize if it's going to change, it starts with me. If it's going to move, I'm going to have to move it. If it's going to shift, I'm going to have to shift it. To take your responsibility that God wants to change things and He wants to use you to do it. Can somebody high five two people and say, God can use me? God, God can use me. I feel something happening in this place. I feel something moving. I I feel something stirring. I feel like somebody needs to shout out to God with a voice of triumph. Can you say that? Can you say that? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey. I'm about to blow a gasket. <laughs> now look, this is very important. Because I'm trying to take the whole context of the Bible but preach one message. So John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. All things were made by Him. It goes through the whole chapter. Because Jesus' his eternal name is not Jesus, it's Word. There are three that testify in heaven, 1 John says. The Father, the Word, and the Spirit. He was only Jesus in the earth. His eternal name is Word. And the Word became flesh. <laughs> so you read down to verses chapter 1 in John. You read down to verses 12 through 14 talking about the word then it says and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and that's where all the preachers stop no 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 no. next verse and we beheld the glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father what did Adam lose glory Adam lost heaven's backing meaning he spoke and nothing in the earth listened anymore Jesus came not just to die and get back. If that's true, let's just do Easter and go home. Jesus came to restore original intent. The original intent was Adam, this is mine. I want you to run it. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. He gave those five commands. This is in, I hold you responsible, Adam, for the condition of my creation. So rule it and rule it with my backing. Just don't eat this tree. You say, why did God do that? Why did God give choice? Because love in its truest form is chosen. It's not forced. When my kids were little and I've been gone all day or I've been gone overnight preaching and I drive up in the driveway, I don't want my wife sitting there saying, now look, your daddy's home, go hug him. <laughs> that hug don't mean anything. But when they're on their bicycles and they're in their treehouse and they throw everything and come run into that car saying daddy's home, that is the greatest thing in the world. So God always gives choice because love in its purest form chooses. So here comes Jesus, the word become flesh, and we behold glory. We behold what God originally meant. And what does Jesus start doing? 
talking to everything. He talks to demons and they obey. He don't anoint them with oil. He don't wrestle on the ground. He just speaks to them. Jesus didn't lay his hands on Lazarus. He sent his mouth in there. And when he sent his mouth in there, that dead corpse came to life. Jesus is speaking to the wind and it quits blowing. Jesus talks to water. The waves quit filling the boat. Jesus talks to fever and it leaves. Jesus talks to dead carcasses and they come back to life. Come on somebody. Jesus talks to a fig tree and it dies. He, don't, he goes around and starts talking to them. And what are we doing? We're beholding glory. So if it was just about death and resurrection, he could have came, died, and went back. But for three years, he made us watch him. Look at me. Watch me. Disciples, follow me. Learn from me. And he went around. Lazarus, come forth. Come out of them. Come out of her. Leave him now. Speaking to it. Rebuking the winds. Rebuking the waves. Look at the fig tree. May no one ever eat from you again. Just dies. And that's all he's doing. And then there's a Roman centurion who has one of his servers that are sick. And this guy's not even Hebrew or Jewish. As far as he's concerned, he's a Gentile. He's a heathen. And he's sitting back watching this. He's watching Jesus talk, and every time he talks, things move and shift and change and come out and leave. And, and he's just watching. So finally, Jesus is like, all right, I'll get to your house and I'll heal you serving him. He's like, oh no, I know how this works. I see what's going on here. He said, you ain't got to come to my house. You just speak a word. You just, do I have anybody over here? You just speak a word. And that word will travel all the way to where my servant is and will raise him up. Excuse me. I, I came tonight to speak a word of life into your dead things, your dead dreams, your dead marriage, your dead relationship, your dead career, your dead business. Somebody throw up your hands and declare something good over yourself. Declare it, prophesy it, say it. Somebody say something good about your family, about your husband. Speak it, speak it, speak it, speak it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I find your neighbor and say, say something, say something. Don't stand there with your mouth shut, say something. My God, my God, my God. Oh, I'm feeling this thing. Hey. Hallelujah. I, I preach to the love. Y'all love me over here? I preach to the love. Okay. I'll give y'all another chance in a minute. <laughs> One more time, 30 seconds. Say something good over yourself. Say something. Y'all gonna get me in trouble and I ain't gonna be asked back. <laughs> I 
the Roman centurion, he said, look, I know what I'm seeing. You're talking and something's backing you up. Because every time you say something, stuff changes. Look what he said. He said, I also am a man under authority. He did not say I'm a man in authority. He said, I'm a man under authority. He said, I tell this one go and he goes. I tell this one to come and he comes. He said, all you got to do is speak a word. Why? He recognized Jesus was operating with authority that originated somewhere else. And because he was a military leader, he understood how it was working. He said, just speak a word. And then Jesus looked at all the church people and said, I ain't seen faith like this in none of you. <laughs> That's why when Jesus really wants something to break out in the church, he goes and gets folk out of the street and messed up and broken and in trouble and brings them right in and all of a sudden revival breaks out. Okay, I got to keep going. Oh, I about preached up all my time already. Whew. Somebody's going to have to feed me tonight, and I don't mean a salad either. Something's going to have to die that I live tonight. I'm up there in the Bay Area, everybody eats bean sprouts and stuff. I, I'm out there killing animals and grilling them in the backyard. I, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, if you would, please, sir. Thank you. For it was fitting for him, talking about Jesus, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory. What was my first sentence? Original intent. He made him and crowned him with what? Glory and honor. Jesus came and we beheld the But it was fitting for him not to be the only one. And bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect. Is there such a thing as imperfect salvation? No, let me tell you what that means. It means you have not possessed everything the cross has supplied you with until you function in glory. It does not end at salvation. It ends in the original intent of God being reestablished in the earth again. Folks, there's a lot of those verses in the Bible nobody can understand, so they skip over them. I don't skip them. Romans 8, the earth is in the pains of child, in the pains of childbirth groaning, awaiting to be delivered from its corruption into the glorious hands of the children of God. It didn't say it was awaiting to be delivered for Jesus to come back. He's coming back. I believe in it, and I'm going to be on the first load out. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But there's some stuff that's supposed to happen by us before that happens. The Bible says in Ephesians 3.10 to the intent that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers of darkness. That the God of this world will see the church rise up in the glory of God and take these systems and shift them and change them back so that now heaven and earth once again function the same way. My God, I'm preaching. Hallelujah. So now, God is arraigned in glory and honor. He made man and crowned him with glory and honor. Adam sinned and lost the glory, Romans 3, 23. Jesus came and we beheld glory. And it makes your salvation perfect when you ascend and begin to function in the glory. I don't mean this cheap, empty, 
just blab and grab and you don't even live a life halfway worthy. I'm talking about understanding that in, the, in your tongue is the power of life and death. You can give life to a thing if you know how to use your mouth and you can kill a thing if you know how to use your mouth. Ladies, you can talk your marriage back to life with your mouth. You can talk him right out the door with your mouth. Come on, somebody. You can create a relationship with your mouth. You can create an enemy with your mouth. You can be the person every company wants to hire with your mouth. You can be the one they can't wait to leave by your mouth. It's power of life and death in your tongue. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying tonight? Shout amen. I'm finishing up. Man, y'all done got me tore up. Now, tell you what, I'm going to minister a little bit. Brother Terrence, if you would, go to the keyboard, let's shift it. So, now, it is fitting for him to take Ron Carpenter and let Ron Carpenter go stand on a piece of land for his church and say this belongs to the kingdom of God. I'm not talking about empty, weightless words that you don't mean. I'm talking about walking in the hospital room with your grandmother and you say, you shall live and you will not die and you shall declare the works of the Lord. And the next day she's pulling stuff out of her arm saying, I'm packing my bags, let's go home. I'm talking about real sons and daughters of authority. I'm talking about you having something so on your life, you walk into a room and change it. <laughs> One of the greatest men of God I've ever had an opportunity to know and be in relationship with somebody, very few, very few people get to be around him. And somebody was saying, what is he like? What is he like? I said, this is what he's like. I said, you don't see him enter the room, but you know when he came in. Because the gross weight and glory that enters a room when he comes in it. The glory that's on his life. Now the Bible says, we who with unveiled faces, talking about those that have been born again, all reflect the glory of the Lord and we are being changed into that same glory from faith to faith from glory pastor you have come in here in 40 minutes and you told me God is clothed in glory he crowned Adam with glory Adam lost the glory. Jesus brought back the glory. He raises us to glory. And now you're telling me it has levels? I'm tired. <laughs> glory to glory. <clears throat> How do you go to a new glory? Because that is my impartation to you tonight. Can I have five more minutes to tell you? No organ, no drums. Just let me talk to you. Are these speakers going to holler at me? I don't want to mess you up right here. Okay. They came and told Jesus, and I'm, I'm giving you the condensed version. Lazarus is sick. Jesus said, this will be for glory. And Jesus waited four days. Then Jesus goes to where Lazarus is and the same people that said he's sick, now they're ticked. Because now he's dead. So they hit Jesus right as he's entering town and wearing him out. And he said again, he said, did I not tell you this would be for glory? Wow. 
And something dawned on me that's kind of hard for me to wrap my head around, but the Bible says, as the heavens are above the earth, so are his ways higher than our ways and his thoughts higher than our thoughts. God doesn't do things like I want him to all the time. Excuse me, God doesn't do things like I want him to about 99% of the time. <clears throat> Jesus waits four days, Lazarus dies, everybody's crying, they start talking about the resurrection and the life. And she says, I know, you know, if you'd have been here, you could have healed him. Jesus said, he will live again. She said, I know he'll live again at the resurrection. She just don't get it. Jesus is trying to say, no, I'm not talking about then. I'm not talking about yesterday. I'm talking about right now. This is, this is an opportunity for glory. And Jesus waited four days and let it deteriorate on purpose so that they could see a glory they had never seen. Be because the glory of healing sick people had already been revealed, but nobody had been raised from the dead. And Jesus said, y'all know about a sick guy and a guy that sleeps. He said, for me, it's all about glory. And God let it go down on purpose so that he could reveal a side of him that had never been revealed before. My oldest son, he's a bodybuilder now. He's 30 years old. He's got a gorgeous wife. He's got three kids. Great house, two cars, a dog, he's a fence. He's doing so good. My oldest son was horribly, horribly, horribly strung out on drugs and he absolutely liked to kill our house. I know of 12 times he was arrested. I don't know the tens of thousands of dollars I've spent on seven or eight different rehabs. He totaled seven cars. And it always happened on Saturday night a few hours before I preached. He would come and knock on the door looking raggedy and like a skeleton with his eyes. The eyeballs like they're about to fall out of their sockets. He was so skinny. And I remember him just, he would just ask for some juice. I prayed over that boy every night. I stood over his door sill and pled the blood of Jesus over his room every night. We sit and I acted out Bible stories. I didn't just read them, I acted out Lazarus. Every night I taught them boys the Bible, they could quote scriptures backwards and forwards. And he got around the wrong crowd and what he was playing with and thought he had it, he turned around and it had him. And I thought he was gonna die. I kept waiting for that real call. I got so many three o'clock in the morning calls, but I had just about settled in I'm headed toward that call. Because I did not know how he was going to sustain his lifestyle. No, it had about killed him. And here I am, God's man of faith and power, with a church of 22,000 members in a town of 80,000. We went in this small town and built a dome that set over 5,000 people packed it out two and three times a Sunday and my son's out there on the street somewhere and I don't know where he is and I did everything I knew to do I spoke everything I knew to spoke I prayed everything I knew to pray I sang everything I knew to say I fasted everything I knew to fast and I sat there and I kept watching it go down and the more I do the more it drops and the harder I'd push and the more will I had to try to see my son survive and sit free, the worse it would get. And I just had to sit there and watch it go down, 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 down. And I didn't understand that sometime it's not even about the person. It's about glory. And God will let something get so low 
till he is the only option left. My son got saved in my arms. My son got del gloriously delivered from every drug you can take. They asked him in rehab what drug you addicted to. He said all of them. Alcoholic, drug addict. Had years of his life he couldn't even remember. And about when I said my son's going to die. My firstborn son, after three miscarriages, who we prayed and believed for, God, he's going to die. And then God reveals a glory. <laughs> And I look at him today and I can't even recognize that old person. And I wonder before I leave, how many of you are here are just watching something go down? And no matter what you do, the marriage just gets worse. No matter what you do, the diagnosis just keeps going down. No matter what you do, your children stray further and further and further. No matter how hard you work, you're closer to losing it all than you ever had. And you're giving and you're first fruiting and you're tithing and you're sowing and everything that the Word of God has taught us to do through the men and women of God. And you're looking at it and it just keeps. And you're wondering what's going on. God's about to take you to a new glory. I can't see that brother, but blow that thing, man. Blow it one more time. Hallelujah. That's signaling a new glory right there. Can you do something quick? I'm going to give this thing back to pastor. You have been amazing. This has been the highlight of my new year, being with you. I so hope I get asked to come back. But I'm gonna tell you something. And I know what time it is, I hope I don't get in trouble. I don't mean you've had a bad day. I don't mean you've got a toothache. I don't mean you had to take two Tylenol, et cetera, et cetera, today. That's not what I'm talking about. You are standing there watching something. No matter what you do, it gets worse. And your heart is breaking and you're exhausted and your efforts feel like they've been in vain. And this message is the first thing that's made your situation make sense. If that's you, I have to pray for you before I leave. Can you very quickly run up here with me? I need to pray for you. Come up here. Come up here with me. Come up here with me right now. <laughs> my God, my God, my God. Look at this. <laughs> oh, there's going to be an impartation of glory on this house tonight. About 60% of the people got up out of their chairs. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
guys. There's no way everybody's going to get up here. I, honestly, I didn't expect this. By the way, this message that I preached to you tonight has 52 messages in this series. 2015, I preached 52 Sundays on the word glory for one entire year on one word. This is just a small portion of it. I'll let Pastor give the instruction if he needs everybody to go back to their seat after I get through whatever he wants to do. I just had to obey God. I care about you. Can I tell you something? I know where you are. I know what it is to hurt so bad you're feeling like you're about to have panic attacks rolling around in your bed at night. I know what it is for your heart to beat out of your chest when you see the light on your phone come on. I know that feeling. I carried my son into the emergency room twice in my arms with white foam running out of his mouth or the OD. And I walked in right in the I walked right in the emergency room and I said, Is he alive? I just looked at the doctor, I said, Is he alive? He's like a noodle in my arms. And I mean everything I did, it didn't do nothing but get worse. But when God turned his life around, I mean God turned him around and set him in a place where everybody his friends have turned around his family members have gotten saved his cousins have started coming to church everybody he ran with it has been a miracle he's the best father you can't imagine what kind of father he is he coaches all his son's ball teams I saw that glory and God could have done it much earlier on, but I'd seen that happen many times at an altar. But I'd never seen anybody brought back from where he brought my son back. I don't care how bad your situation is. God will let it deteriorate on purpose so he can show off. Tonight, God turns it around. Throw your hands in the air. I'm going to pray and I'm going to give it to Pastor. Father, this is impartation conference. I come here tonight with a message of the glory of God to hurting people. With a message that God is about to show up amongst people who are confused and bewildered and disillusioned because despite everything they've done, it keeps getting worse. And I thank you that you have brought me and them together in this moment in time to let a word go forth in this house and to the people online and to the people in overflow where they realize my situation has purpose and that God is going to redeem this in such a loud, boisterous way that people everywhere are going to see these good works and glorify God. So Lord, tonight, somebody say, take my situation, Lord, and reveal your glory. Somebody say it again, take my situation and reveal your glory. One more time, say, take my situation and reveal your glory. Now I just want you to give him praise right there where you are and worship him. Take it, take it, take it, turn it, turn it, turn it. Reveal, 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 reveal. Show your glory, show your glory, show your glory, show your glory, show it. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, show your glory. Reveal your glory. Show your glory. Show your glory. Show your glory. He speaks under a man of God and then it happens what you got to do right now is say I receive it right now this one more time I receive it right now you know we were talking about this year being the year of harvest 
another way to say it's a year of glory. That there would be, this would be the year where the seeds that were planted and watered, you would see the manifestation of it. How many believe this word is right in agreement with what God is saying to our church? People that you never thought would be saved, come on, are going to be saved. Breakthroughs that you've been waiting for for years. This is going to be the year it's going to manifest. And you're going to give all the glory and honor to the Lord. Are you receiving this impartation? You know, I love, I love what we, they sang a song just a minute ago. He's the Alpha and the Omega. You know what that means? He's the beginning and the end. You know what that means? He gets the last word. He said, I'm not the middle because things change in the middle. There's storms in the middle, but I'm the beginning and the end. When it's all said and done, it's going to match up with what I say in the beginning and what I say in the end. Come on, let's give God some praise. God said it. This is glory time. Expect it. Church, we love you. God loves you, and I, he absolutely loves you. And his plans for your good and not evil, it's going to end with our family all getting saved. That's how it's going to end. You're going to end in victory. Come on. You're not going to end in depression. You're not going to end in failure. Come on. You're going to end where your life and your family, come on, and everything you touch is going to glorify your Father in heaven. That they're going to know this. They're going to know this. There's no way they could have did it. It must be the blessing and the glory of God upon them. Are you ready to have a glorious 2024? Let's give God one more praise. Come on. Praise the worship team.